A very different idea. Welcome, Samsa. So this idea of restraining anger, making sure that we're channeling it correctly, and make sure that we're dealing with it appropriately, th this is what matters. Like getting angry, uh, we had said there's nothing wrong with getting angry. Even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to anger. Um, uh, a man said to Umar, I swear by Allah, you do not judge justly nor distribute evenly. Umar angered to the point where it was visible on his face. So a man said to him, Amir al Mu'mineen, have you not heard Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's statement? Be tolerant and command what is right. Pay no attention to foolish people. And this individual is from the foolish. Umar said, You're right. If uh, it was as if a flame had arisen, then was put out. So uh, sometimes these spiritual reminders, uh, they're, they're very helpful. Uh, but other times it depends on the usage. So there are many times that we will have come people like people will come and tell us about you know don't get angry. The Prophet said, is that th is that usually what we want to hear in those situations? <laughs> usually not. And I, I found it I find it interesting here. He actually doesn't say that right. He doesn't t tell him like you know don't get angry. He just recites this ayah to him, and he uses as it means like hey listen and just kind of giving context to what he was experiencing and what was happening. Uh, but th this idea of of use kind of like beating people over the head with like ayat and a hadith, it's it's just not it's not healthy and it, it doesn't it, it doesn't help the situation. Um, it can actually cause somebody to say something that is inappropriate, uh, and we have to be careful in how we use them. It, it's not the it's not, it shouldn't be the first line of defense. Also, um, you know sometimes when you lose something or something breaks, what, what is a, a very common response in those situations huh okay. huh no like what it, no other people say to you like it's like yeah you know say salam the prophet it's like okay it's, it's not wrong you know what i mean and it just it kind of adds to the frustration because you're like you can't say anything because he's not saying anything wrong but at the same time what is what is the response that we generally want to hear the, what is the first thing that we would like to hear like affirmation, right? At least some type of affirmation. Like, okay, yeah, yes, I'll send salah on the Prophet Yes, I shouldn't get angry. Yes, I should make dua. Yes, I should be thankful. I get all that. But at least what? Validate. Like, at least validate me. Like, at least acknowledge that, like, you know, I'm hurt. Like, I really like that car. It's okay. You know what I mean? Like, I had a little bit of attachment that's there. I didn't want to get into an accident. Now I got to, like, drive around a rental for the next two weeks. You know what I mean? So th these things are definitely... Uh, Right, uh, you know these things are definitely uh, you know problematic, and we shouldn't we shouldn't dismiss them. Uh, Muhammad ibn Kaab, uh, uh, he said, "Whoever has the three following characteristics has complete belief in Allah. When he is pleased, he does not allow it to take him to evil. When he is angry, he does not allow it to take from the truth. Whenever anything happens, he will never take what is not his." Um, so he will not. He won't justify. So if somebody like takes his shoes, like he'll go put on somebody else's slippers. You know what I mean? Like I don't know if you guys are. Do women have that problem, or is that like a man thing? Mm. When they come to the masjid, our shoes, our shoes get stolen. Mm. Is it's a man thing? Right, okay. <laughs> Men be stealing shoes. Like it's it's just like a it's a big thing. I, I like giving the excuse like okay you know they uh, they mist they mistook the shoes like for someone else's. But it's like, okay, there's no way anybody <laughs> mistake. Like, you're not going to mistake like $300 Jordans, right? So they're, um, <laughs> this is only, by excuse, you know, like they're only, they can only go so far. I know, right? <laughs> it's like, they look just like mine, right? It's like, I could have, I could I could have sworn they look like my, <laughs> my Adidas slides. <laughs> so, um. These, these things, again, it's just a matter of channeling that anger, making sure that we're using it in the proper way. Uh, a man came to Salman and said, Abu Abdullah, advise me. Salman said, do not anger. He said, I'm unable to. Like, I'm, I'm going to get angry. So he says here, whenever you anger, hold your tongue in hand. So th this is, again, a piece of advice that usually the harm comes from where? It's either going to come from the tongue or from actually striking or actually hitting someone. Uh, so the next chapter here is the virtue of hilm, or the virtue of forbearance or sabr. Um, know that sabr is better than suppressing anger. So over here, this is the opposite. So over there, he was talking about the lowest spectrum. The lowest spectrum is to actually suppress anger. Right? He's, he's saying that that's the lowest spectrum. What we should actually be striving and achieving for is what? Is, is sabr. Right? We should actually be striving for hilm and sabr and forbearance and actually learning how to practice these things. Um, He's saying suppressing anger is like a last resort, right? You, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't even have to get to that point where you're enraged. You shouldn't get to that point where you're actually consumed. You should already develop that natural tolerance for this characteristic. 
Uh, and this, a lot of this is based on the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he says Al -ilm wa hilm That knowledge is by seeking it and forbearance is by, by practicing it uh, So even if I don't have a characteristic, I can keep practicing that characteristic in order for that characteristic to become second nature If I practice something enough, it actually becomes part of my nature uh, and, and that's basically what the message is here if I want to be patient and I don't feel I'm patient enough or I feel I'm impatient, I have to keep practicing it. And, and eventually what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to build up that tolerance. I'm actually going to build up, wow. <laughs> I'm going to build up that emotional. <laughs> the, they're testing the, the, Yeah, they're, uh, they're testing something. Right? So <laughs> the, you, know, you have to kind of build up that, uh, that emotional stamina to deal with, I don't, I don't want to say wall because building up an emotional wall is a bad idea. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> Uh, just a game. Huh? Just a game. Yeah, you know, it's, it, because what, what's the difference between emotional tolerance and an emotional wall? Do you guys know? Uh, emotional tolerance is by tolerating uh, how frustrated and how angry you can be. Yes. But the emotional wall, I think, is that preventing yourself from doing something you might regret. Yeah. Blocking. I think. Yeah. So an emotional wall is basically blocking. Uh, what happens is like regardless of the emotions that are being thrown at you, you kind of build up this wall and how do you react? So you stonewall, like, you know what I mean? You just don't, you're just very stoic, you just don't react, you don't deal with the situation. And, and it's not healthy because you end up frustrating the person that's in front of you. Uh, so we have to make sure that we develop an emotional tolerance and this emotional strength to make sure that we're interacting and reacting appropriately. Sure, I have a question. Sure. Well, what if it like, reaches a position where somebody says, like, you know, the society says, what's wrong with this guy or like, what's wrong with this girl? They're so naive mm. that, you know, they're not standing up or ju they're just letting the situation like continue. Like you mm -hmm. know when you control yourself, yeah. somebody for example, um, he insults or hits you. Yeah. But you, because you're a good person, you try to avoid uh, insulting him back or hitting him back. Yeah. But the society will say, look at this ignorant and naive person. Like he doesn't even- uh, Defend himself, himself, yeah. Yeah, defend himself. Okay, so yeah. they, uh, what do you guys think? How should a person <laughs> respond in that situation? Call the cops. Okay. Call. Okay, that's fine. I, I, that's fine. Like this person is controlling their anger, etc. Everything. But the question is now: If I have somebody who is being insulting, I have somebody who is being aggressive. What do I do? She's like, I need to be. I need to be pa patience. Right? We're not. We're not. We're not pacifists. That's a very. That's a very important point. Like a Muslim is not a pacifist. But what should I do? Huh? Okay, uh, walk away. So it, again, it depends. Number one, it depends on the context and the nature of the relationship, right? So every time I'm upset with my wife or my wife is upset with we, can we just walk away every time? It's like, huh? Right? You, you, yeah, you can, right? Or, or, oh wow, <laughs> that escalated like super quickly. <laughs> um, coworkers, your boss, right? So we have to understand there are a lot of relation dynamics that definitely do come into play. But let's just assume that these two people are friends or they're colleagues or they're, um, like they're associates, they just know each other, and one person is constantly abusive. What can I do in that situation? And we had talked about the three situations, right? When you're dealing with somebody who's in a position of authority, when you're dealing with a subordinate, and when somebody is on the same uh, playing field as you. Right, you have to set boundaries, right? That's, that's very important. How I set those boundaries depends on the nature of the relationship. So if I'm in a relationship where we're on the same playing field, how do I set that boundary? Mm. is not appropriate, I don't, mm -hmm. you, you do your best to forgive first so, time, uh -huh. and let the person know, sure. then second time you can get more okay. satisfaction. So I, you brought up an interesting point, so you, there's a difference between forgiving and overlooking, right? So overlooking means what? I, I ignore it, like I don't, I don't even address it. Forgiveness can be part of that, right? You, meaning that you overlook it and you don't address it, but the overlooking, where should that happen? In what type of relationships? Huh? With your superior? Maybe. When you're, oh, when you, okay. Oh, if you're in a position of authority. Good. And, and in Islam, where is the position of authority? As a parent or as a? Well, as a William, oh, sure. That's good. But I'm saying as a parent, it's another one that you guys are probably scared to say. As a husband, right? So as a husband, you should lo overlook what? Some of the things that have shortcomings. Some shortcomings of your wife. Why? Because if, if you don't, then 
the situation can get worse, mm -hmm. and there will be fitna or fasad. Then other people wow. Okay. <laughs> wow. That's wow. That 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 escalated all the way. I I was looking for a different answer. I was gonna say because we have shortcomings, <laughs> but I guess like I guess no, no not not just that. Is does it make sense with like in a husband wife situation that we're constantly picking at each other's faults? No. It's it's not going to be a successful relationship. It's not going to be a successful marriage. So. I should overlook why, because as a whole, it's what? Hopefully. It's wrong. Oh, uh, hopefully it's good, right? Hopefully the situation is good. Hopefully the relationship is good. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's single, sisters. So like, <laughs> so, like <laughs> so you, you look at the relationship as a whole, right? Th this is the important thing. Like I look at the relationship in context. I look at the relationship as a whole. And because of that, I'm willing to overlook these small things because I know about myself, I have what? I have shortcomings too. And, and, and that's where I think it's, it's important. Like, um, even with friends, is it going to be as much? No, your tolerance is going to be less. Why? Because the, a friendship is what? It's equal. No, not just equal, it's voluntary. Right? Do I need to be in a friendship? No. Is there anything tying me to this person? Like, no, I have to be friends with this person. I was, uh, I was uh, Right, you co-sign alone, but they're your business partner, you know, <laughs> right? It's beyond friendship at that point. Um, but there are a number of different dynamics that are definitely at play. And when you have the more voluntary a relationship, right, the less tolerance we should have. But the problem is if you look, it's usually what? Yeah. It's usually the opposite. You know what I mean? Like, so the more voluntary a relationship, the more tolerant we tend to be. And the more restricted we are, the less tolerant we tend to be. You know, so like as a parent, did, did my son or daughter have a choice for me as a father? No. Right, and I didn't have a choice for them as a son or daughter. But we, we, have, we tend to have less tolerance. Like with wives, people who we chose, right? Like, it's like, so like we chose this woman, or like as a wife I chose this husband, I agreed consensually to this relationship, and I don't have a lot of tolerance. But with friends, people who we can literally just one day just walk away and be like, I don't wanna be friends anymore. Right, like that, that's what a friendship is. We, we, want, we try so hard to hold on to them. And, and we, we really should change that perspective. Even the Prophet ﷺ, he said, خيركم, خيركم لأهلي, خيركم لأهلي. The best of you is the one who is best to his wives or family, depending on how you translate it. And I am the best to my wives. And we have to learn to overlook. We have to learn to overlook. Uh, and forgiveness. So that was overlooking. What about forgiveness? What does forgiveness entail? To okay, yeah, you definitely have to acknowledge, for sure. What else? Oh, even if the other person doesn't acknowledge, can I still forgive them? Can. I have that choice But the, the, the thing that I want you guys to kind of take away Is you own your forgiveness Like if somebody wrongs me I have a choice to forgive Do I have to? No, no I don't I don't and, and some people go, well it's better to forgive Yeah it is, in general it is definitely better to forgive But does it make sense for me to force myself to forgive someone And constantly have that anger and hate in my heart? No And is that true forgiveness? No It's not I haven't really left it up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I, I have every right to hold this person accountable, but can I constantly dangle it in that person's face? Right? I forgave this person from st stealing $10 from me. And that every few weeks, I was like, yeah, man, remember when you stole that $10 from me and I forgave you for that? Is that, is that true forgiveness? No. The, y you were oppressed initially, but now you have become what? Oppressed. You've become the oppressor. Because you're claiming to have forgiven this person, or even if you don't forgive this person, let's say you don't forgive this person, that's fine too, that's also your choice. But the moment I decide not to forgive this person, I have made an active decision that I have left his affair with what? I've left his affair with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and there's no reason for me to what? To re-engage. I can't re-engage. Yeah. Well, it, it, too much of anything. Right? Yeah, Allah must That's why I brought up this. But, but that's not being forgiving, Yaki. No, that's, that's actually being naive. What do you mean? So if somebody is constantly abusing me and I'm taking it, am I being forgiving or am I, am I using forgiveness as an excuse because I can't stand up for myself? No, it's not because I can't stand up. Yes, it is. I guarantee, 90% of the time. No, it's not, uh, well, maybe what do you mean? Physically? Well, physically? Yaki, no, no, no. even verbally. If verbally something, somebody's constantly abusing me and I choose to remain in that situation. What if I said, oh, I said, uh, and then I walk away? Every single time? 
Now, how are you ending up in that situation again? This is a question that needs to be asked. Okay? The first two, three times, I understand maybe you bumped into him, maybe the situation. It's like, okay, are you looking for this person now? <laughs> you know what I mean? That it's become 10, 15, 20 times? This is something that we really need to ask ourselves. Like, why do I keep ending up in this situation? In Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, يعني, ma ma halukum. He says, Kunna mustadafina fil ard. They say, what, what was your situation in this earth? And they said, we were weak and oppressed in the land. He said, Alam takun ardullah It's like, what, was Allah's earth not wide enough for you to migrate therein? Yeah. And, also and he said, your place is in the hellfire. <laughs> we, we, are not, we are not allowed. We are not allowed to be oppressive, nor are we allowed to put our, ourselves in situations where we are oppressed. If we don't have a choice, you know, even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He goes on to say, you know, you know, you know what I mean? Like, except those individuals who are weak and elderly and the women, you know what I mean? Like people who didn't have a choice, that's different. If you don't have a choice, you don't have a choice. Like, I'm voluntarily putting myself in a situation where somebody's talking down to me, yelling at me, oppressing me, beating me. Okay, like, no man, I have to get out of that situation. But I don't want to be... Uh, I don't want to hit him, for example. See, that's the... No, no, but think, think about what you just said. You're saying that either I say nothing or I hit him. Okay. What, do, what do we call this? Extremism. 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 That's all it is. It's, binary. it's, it's very binary. There's, let's say it's, yeah. there's nothing else I can do. I can't complain about it. Mm. Because nobody's... Uh, let's say I'm in a society where nobody's going to care about the situation. Well, I can't, for example, tell him to stop because it's just going to keep... Yeah, he, li li listen, if, if you're talking about in a vacuum where you live in a world where it's just you and him and you can't do anything about it, there's nothing I can really advise you. There's nothing you can do. But we, we live in a society that is, involves a number of people. It's not just me alone. You know what I mean? It's not just you and him or him and her or whatever the case might be. Like we, we live in a, a complex social structure. And just because, and many times, you guys have heard, I, I've tried everything. We, we've heard this. We've heard our say, ourselves say this many times. What is the problem with that statement? It's a lie. There's no <laughs> doubt. But how do we know it's a lie? It's a lie because it's everything I know I've tried. Does that make sense? So within my little pigeonhole view of the world, everything I know I've tried it. Is there a world around my worldview? What do I have to do to find out? Google. Uh -huh, Google. I can. And probably get some really bad advice like from Reddit, yeah. from Reddit or Quora, right? <laughs> but what, what, can, what should I actually do? Huh? Seek advice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders us, He tells us. Go and go consult with people. The problem, the reason we don't want to consult is why? It's usually our own arrogance. Well, I, I tried everything. It's like, wow, you know everything too, mashallah. <laughs> no, right? like we, we seek, this is why we seek counsel, because it's a sign of our own humility. It's a sign that we actually don't know everything and we need to talk to people, to get more insight, to get, you know, to help us with situations and issues. And many times we don't want to share those problems with others because we're afraid of how we'll look. You know, to, to the extent that you can have marriages will destroy, relationships with children will be destroyed, right? You know, your, your status might even be destroyed, but just because of our own egos, we will refuse to go and admit these things to anyone. You know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Um, so yeah, like we, we can't allow ourselves to be in situations where we're oppressed. And if I have no choice, at that point, what? I leave it to Allah. I have no choice. I just make the eye and I ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to, to, you know, to lift whatever, you know, problem it is. Because I, I can't do anything about it. I want to, but I can't. So here, this is an interesting situation. Huh? Allah's messenger. I have relatives with whom I try <laughs> uh, to have close relationship, but they sever this relationship. I treat them well, but they treat me ill. I'm sweet to them, but they are harsh toward me. Upon this, he sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "If it is as you say, then you in fact." Uh, throw hot ashes upon their faces and there would always remain with you on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala an angel to support you who would keep you dominant over them so long as you adhere to this path of righteousness what do you guys think about this statement? what is the Prophet ﷺ basically telling him? he said if you are in a situation where you have no choice and you have to maintain certain ties in certain relationships what is he saying to do? forbear forbear like seek spiritual recourse Know that every time that these people are, are trying to take advantage of you, that there are angels that are throwing hot coals in their face. And that their angels are there to support you. And that you are not alone. Right? You, you actually have support. You have the spiritual support. But this, again, this is a situation where you have no choice.
but, but when you do have a choice, like for example, Ibrahim alayhi salam, at what point did he leave his father? <laughs> when they threw him in the fire. <laughs> right? Like when they're, they're trying to kill, they're literally, literally trying to kill him. And he was like, okay, maybe it's time for me to go. <laughs> maybe it's time for me to go. He tried everything, right? <laughs> right? Like he tried everything at that point. Like he actually tried everything, right? So, uh, so, so the thing is, like, it's it's important to to keep in mind some of these things, man. It's, you know, it, it it is okay to to break certain relationships depending on how toxic those relationships are. I mean, if that wasn't the case, well, why would Allah Subhanahu wa Taala allow divorce? You know what I mean? Or, or some people will be like, okay, well, what about the hadith? You know, don't don't abandon your brother for more than three days. What does that mean? Like abandonment is something that's active. If I haven't spoken to my friend for in a week, does that mean I've abandoned him? No. no, right? Abandonment is active. Like I'm trying not to talk to this person. If I just happen not to talk to him or happen not to see him or her or whatever the case might be, I'm not intentionally doing that, right? There, there's a big difference. Like, is it okay for for some people just to see their families like two three times a year? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Why? Because I'm not actively trying to what? To avoid them. I mean, it, like, the thing is, every, everybody has their own dynamic, right? Everybody has their own family situation, and it's important to, you know, keep those things in mind. Your, your family shouldn't feel like, they shouldn't feel abandoned, but at the same time, can I use their feelings to guide my decisions? No, I don't Like, I, I, have, I have to many times set my own boundaries. Um, and it's, it's just unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Uh, it's there's there's like so many narrations about just showing uh, forbearance, you know, for showing hen, for showing sabr, for showing um, for showing patience, and all, all these things are like are really really important. Like you know, they're just verses and explanations of those verses that talk about uh, a lot of these things. Um, so here, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Let those who are sedate and prudent be near me than those who are next to him." Yeah, he said he said it three times and beware of the tumult of the markets. So he sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Not only is he encouraging others to be patient, not only is he encouraging others to to show this forbearance, but he he is also encouraging us to surround ourselves with people who have have those characteristics. Right? If I surround myself with angry people, the chances of me being angry is going to right is going to increase. Right? But if I surround myself with people you know who show patience, who show helm, you know who who show um, this like. You know, in dealing with a lot of these issues, they show a lot of wisdom. Those are the people who I really want to surround myself with and I want to spend time with. Uh, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, beware of the tumult of the markets. You know, don't get caught up in it. You know, don't caught, get caught up in, you know, don't spend all your time uh, in the markets. You know, don't spend all your time in the mall. He's not saying don't go to the mall, but he's saying what? Don't spend too much time, too much time there. Don't spend too much time there. Why? Because it's a distraction. Right, there's a lot of distractions, right? There's a lot of worldly distractions. Uh, at the mall and, and we don't want our hearts To become attached to these things It doesn't mean that we don't like things But by going and spending time there Like extra time there There's a higher chance of our hearts being More attached to those things May uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us uh, Give us tawfiq uh, This hadith is actually really interesting So basically there's this individual Who has this, this del uh, gentleness and deliberation Meaning that he's not rushed to make judgments right? He takes time He sits down Like he thinks about things You know he's very um, He's very focused So he said to the He said to the Prophet He said is this something that's natural That I have Or is it something that I've learned The Prophet said no This is a natural trait that you have So even in that He was thankful And he said I thank Allah For putting these traits In me and me being, uh, me having them, and me being able to actually uh, act on them. So what did this house do? They kiss his feet? Huh? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, so basically, what was ha what happened here is that there was a, a waft that came. There was a uh, there was a um, what's, the, what's the word? Chul waft. It's like a group of people that came, like emissaries. Delegate. Like a delegation, oh, thank you. So there's a delegation that came to the Prophet ﷺ, and what happened was like everybody was rushing to get to the Prophet ﷺ, and yet because they wanted to kiss his hands and feet, but he he took his time. So he said, well, you know what? He said, I, the Prophet ﷺ then pointed him out. He said, I like him, and he was like, what? He's like, because you have this gentleness and you have this deliberation. But he didn't he didn't actually scold them for wanting to do this. But he saw so he never scolded anyone for wanting to kiss his hands or his face. Or you know, wanting to be near him or spend time with him, but, but he—I mean—he was a beloved personality, so I said him. Um, you know, people just wanted to be around him. You know, people wanted to be near him, 
Uh, people wanted to talk to him. People wanted to hear him speak. Uh, that's that's just who he was. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Um, uh, this is another one about having taqwa um, and not not showing that you want this world. And even he sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "This is from the ways of." Gaining the pleasure of people by not what? By, by showing that you don't need them, right? And showing that you're not reliant upon them, showing that you want nothing from them. Even he, sallallahu alayhi wa every time he needed money, what did he do? He would take a loan from the Jews. Like, subhanAllah. He, he had people like Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. He had people like Uthman. He had people like Abu Bakr, Umar, who at the, you know, at the drop of a hat would be willing to give everything that they had and he never took money for himself. So he said, why? Huh? Well, the power dynamics is definitely part of it, for sure. What is the other part of it? He wanted to show them what? He had no worldly need from them. He's like, he literally wanted nothing. He wanted nothing from them except their spiritual enlightenment and their spiritual guidance. He, he didn't want them to think even for a moment that he had any type of worldly need from him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is one of the reasons that they loved him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so much. Uh, Omar said, seek knowledge and learn from knowledge, tranquility and forbearance. Ali radiallahu anhu, he said, it is not good just to amass wealth and children, but true good is to amass knowledge, expand your forbearance and boast about worshiping your Lord. If you accomplish this well, praise Allah. And if you do it poorly, seek his forgiveness. Al-Hasan said, seek knowledge and beautify it with dignity and forbearance. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who have dignity and those who have hilm and sabr. Wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu ala khayri khalqin Nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala ala sahbihi wa sallam